welcome viewers to Buelna News. And we we always love our interviews, but today we're going to do an interview on uh, we're going to do an interview with uh, Mr. George Pla with about the book Power Shift. So let me just do a quick in introduction of Mr. Pla. Then we'll get right into the questions, everyone. So George Pla is the co-author of the book Power Shift. He's the founder and CEO of Cordoba Corporation. And, you know, for, 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 for those of you who like, might be wondering, like, what's Cordoba Corporation? And, and, and you, can, you can correct me, um, in Mr. Plaw, but um, your, your, your company was the, was the company that um, brought, I think, part of the space shuttle through Los Angeles um, and, and, and I think brought it to one of the museums. So I wanted to introduce you and can you, can you share with, with, with viewers what Cordoba Corporation did? Because I was fascinated by that. Well, Cordoba is an engineering firm, and uh, I'm on the board of trustees at the California Science Center. And we had the great opportunity and honor to bring this space shuttle endeavor to Los Angeles. But NASA said, prove to us that you can transport it from the airport to downtown safely. It's a billion-dollar asset, and no one had ever moved a space shuttle through uh, urban areas before in the history of, of NASA. So they were nervous about it. And uh, it was our honor to plan this move for 18 months, looking at every variable to move it through uh, the airport, through Inglewood, and to uh, down by the Coliseum. Uh, I'm very proud to tell you, since you asked, that more than 2 million people lined the streets uh, and we had not one single incident, uh, not a pickpocket, not anything uh, that the, the law enforcement was concerned about. I think the community embraced it. They were proud of it. And they all came out with their families to see this, this historic occasion. And we're very proud of that. Absolutely. So, you know, shout out to 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 all the STEM majors and and Cordoba Corporation. But let's get into the book, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Pla. Um, you um, you have an engineering firm, and yet you're the co-author. Um, could you could you could you uh, tell us about um, your other uh, co-author, uh, Doctor Doctor Ayon? Um, you know, what's the relationship? Why? We'll get into some of the specifics, but. Um, you know, you're, this is your, your, your first book. You decided to do this. How did you partner with Dr. Ayon? Well, the interesting story first about uh, the engineering firm that I own. I'm actually a sociology major. And it's a very unique uh, situation where you own a major engineering firm that develops infrastructure, and yet you're in sociology. The relationship to that is that you have a very broad perspective on infrastructure, the impact on communities, the jobs that you create, transit, water, schools, energy. This is not a commercial message. This is the relevance of that background and that perspective takes me to develop uh, a, a book called Power Shift with my co-author, David Ayon. Now to your question, David Ayon is a brilliant political scientist. I met him at Loyola Marymount University. And I simply approached him and said, look, uh, with all due respect, you academics, in quotes, uh, do a lot of research, bring a lot of data together, but oftentimes you don't get it quite right. In the history of Latino po politics, particularly in Los Angeles, I was fortunate to be there, be involved. So I approached my co-author, David Ayon, and said, look, why don't we partner up with your uh, political uh, scientific acumen, your research, and my knowledge of what actually took place? I think it would be a very powerful combination to develop a book like Power Shift. And it's been a great partnership. Uh, it's been very successful. I'm happy to get into Power Shift 1, but I... Might as well tell you already, we're working on a second book, which we can talk about at another time. Okay. The title of the book is Power Shift. What's the power shift from and where did the power shift go? Well, it's our opinion that 
uh, the Latino community was nowhere. Disenfranchised, David even said, disposable. Uh, the history shows uh, how community has been neglected in every way, in education, in healthcare, in housing, and so many other areas, the abuse in law enforcement, unfortunately, uh, because the community, Latino community had uh, no power. They had, were not within the, the corridors of power in institutions like banks and schools, churches, uh, political structures, unions. And I think there's been a significant shift starting with Congressman Roy Ball all the way to Antonio Villaraigosa, where the power has shifted uh, more uh, equitable uh, to the Latino community and frankly, other communities as well, which is why we call this book an American story. So, the, the, you know, a, a question is, and, and, and I understand that, and, and as you know, I'm an elected official as well. I'm here in Los Angeles, a, a trustee at the LA Community Colleges. And, you know, and, and I'm also an attorney. And, and as an attorney, you have to kind of figure out the foundational components of what occurred. So we're talking about a time period here from 19, really, Mr. Roy Ball got elected in the 1950s. Um, but the bulk of the elected officials occurs in uh, 80s and, and, and 90s, some in the 70s. And, and we'll get through that. But does does the rise of these elected officials occur without the, the 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 foundational work of the group that that created the Mendez versus Westminster, you know, school district case with regard to racial discrimination against Mexican Americans and the Chicano movement? You know, does you know do they just do these elected officials just pop up, or does it take that foundational work from decades? Uh, you know, clearly it takes the foundational work that was done, uh, particularly in education. I'm familiar with the Mendes case, and there were others throughout the state. Uh, educators actually don't get the credit they deserve in resisting the inequities in, in our children being educated, not being educated. So, yeah, there's a lot of foundation that was uh, laid down. Um, and frankly, in terms of power, the union movement really preceded elected officials because there was an entry point for, for individuals to get involved and learn about leadership, learn about movements, learn about how to move things, protest, and accomplish victory. Esteban Torres, I think one of those, yes, is a perfect example of that. He was with the United Auto Workers. The United Auto Workers were very active in all communities, and that's where he got his start. I would call that part, the UAW, part of the foundational development of Latino politics, starting with Esteban Torres and beyond. So, you know, the, 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 the power shift that occurred, because most of these elected officials, um, if not all of them, and we'll get to them in a second, are from here in Southern California. Um, what's the role of Southern California in the power shift? And, and, and in Southern California, it's about nine during, especially during these time periods, it's 90, 95% Mexican American to other communities in the Southwest or, 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 the, or the nation. Or is, is Los Angeles an, an epicenter um, of, of what's going on for, and this is for the viewers to understand Kind of, you know, we, we see a lot of political power occurring right now, but I think what's happening in this book is that you're explaining to readers in this book of a nucleus of activism um, that was occurring. T tell, me, tell me about the region in that nucleus of, of activism. Well, activism, and, and David has a much better handle on this, David Ayon, uh, a lot of the activism really started way back in Texas and New Mexico. And it's interesting that a lot of these individuals migrated to Los Angeles is one important factor. The other is that when you look at immigration, the, the immigration movement started uh, coming to Los Angeles, Boyle Heights in particular. We call Boyle Heights the Ellis Island of uh, Los Angeles. It's interesting that those Vies that are featured in our book all lived and worked within two miles of each other. 
So clearly there was something going on in East LA with a community services organization. Cesar Chavez actually started in LA, not in Delano. Uh, Dolores Huerta uh, came later. Uh, Esteban and others all migrated to Los Angeles and it became the epicenter of this development. I, I think it's extraordinary that what these 10 individuals that are featured in PowerShip all lived and worked within two miles of each other in East Los Angeles. Then of course, later that expanded into the San Gabriel Valley, the San Fernando Valley and other places. So in, 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 in the forward of, of, of PowerShip, Congressman Leon Panetta, you know, talks about the, the, that the book captures the rise of, of, of Latino leaders. So but in, what's interesting in your title, you specifically call out Richard Alatorre, Gil Cedillo, Miguel Contreras, Marielena Durazo, Gloria Molina, Richard Polanco, Art Torres, Esteban Torres, and Antonio Villarregosa um, as, as, as individuals that were, you know, that, that were important. What, what should we, this generation, because most, most of these individuals, although you have uh, Gil Cedillo, Marielena Durazo, um, that are still elected officials, but those of us who are a different generation or, or another generation, I'm not going to say newer generation, what should we learn from them that they did that brought power for, for, for community? What, what did they do specifically? Well, they were, they were activists. They marched in the streets. They protested. Uh, more so than what you see today. They kicked down doors. They, uh, dare say, threatened people to uh, pay attention to the Latino community, pay attention to the issues uh, like education in particular, and, and, and be equitable about it. But they were very militant. And uh, more so than I see today, I, I am of the age where I can remember those days, uh, specifically the 70s and the 80s. And uh, this generation today, yours included, I think says we stand on the shoulders of what they did. They're very, very militant, uh, took no quarters, uh, maybe uh, turned off people, offended people, but it had to be done. They marched in the streets. Uh, I remember the smoke on Whittier Boulevard in East LA when they had the, the disturbances, the riots, Ruben Salazar being killed, as everyone knows, by the sheriffs. I mean, it was a very, very difficult, tumultuous time, but it had to be done. And I think that there's lessons learned from that. A lot of progress was made, but then the uh, subsequent generation, yours, are better prepared academically, now part of the, the institutions that have power, you're an attorney, you're an educator, you're an elected official. Uh, those are all opportunities that were frankly provided to you and others by individuals, starting with Ed Roy Ball and all the way up to Mayor Villaraigosa. Let me just say one, you know, before we get into to other parts of the of of the of of, of the book, um, because I, I, the foundational component for your readers is very important, um, because part of the, part of the goal of mine of having this interview is for folks. It's always important for students, anyone who's listening to to get the soul of the author in this component. Right. And you're talking about a lot of times radicals knocking down doors and you had the Mendes case. Um, you had folks coming coming from the union movement um, that you had the, the Chicano movement in its different forms. Did it Plan de Santa Barbara in any way form some of these individuals in their in their in their preparation or policy guidance? I'm not, a, I'm not aware of that. I'm more aware of the community services organization, uh, Tony Rios, uh, Caesar, when he was here in East LA. Uh, I'm more aware of what they have done. Uh, Telacu, back when, mm -hmm. uh, headed up by Esteban Torres, also laid down a foundation. David Lizarraga picked it up after that. Uh, and, 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 you know, when you launch movements like that, you're subject to a lot of criticism. Either people agree with you or don't agree with you, 
but they have to get done. They have to protest. They have to insist on getting resources that are deserved by all communities. And it did lay down the foundation for the 80s when people started getting elected into institutions that frankly have the power and the purse to allocate resources to our communities. And that's so, exactly what's taken place. So in the book, you fo- uh, there, there's a focus on Trump. And in and, and, and being in, in 2021, there's no way to not say that the country has not changed even since the book was there. But early on, as you went to publishing, you you discussed Trump and Trump. So for all of the advancement, Mr. Paul, that 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 Latinos, brown communities in the United States have have made. Trump still, to a certain extent, won by being very clear that he was against Mexicans. Mexican American. Then he extended himself to Muslims and and other countries. So he was very specific that 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 he would that he had a, a Mexican problem. And a lot of folks, you know, you address Proposition 187 and, and, and these different initiatives in the 90s. But the vitriol against Mexican Americans, Central Americans, brown, black, African American, Muslim. That vitriol seems to have grown from the 1990s. It didn't get reduced. It actually grew. What did what did the power shift generation do to prepare us for some of the challenges of today? I remember a talk by Jesse Jackson at the Biltmore Hotel who said, uh, you all may think we've made a lot of progress, but we could easily go backwards uh, very quickly by people that would come out and uh, be against everything that we've ever uh, accomplished. I remember listening to that, Gabriel, and I thought, no, I don't think so. I think we're too institutional, we're entrenched, we're gaining power. I don't think we can go back. Well, I was wrong. Uh, he gave that talk in you know mid eighties. And I was wrong that we could Uh, go backwards rather quickly when you get attacked by people like Trump. However, uh, upon reflection and a discussion I had with David Ayon uh, when uh, Trump got elected, you know, is this a major setback given the attacks that he launched against the Latino community? And the conclusion is, uh, may surprise you, that it's not a setback because we learned from 209 we learned from 187. There was 100,000 people that marched in City Hall. We do have people in office. At the time that Trump get ele- got elected, we had a council president in the LA. We had a mayor. We had a speaker of the House and pro tem of the Senate, uh, school board presidents. And so we had a lot of people in place that could launch what we call the resistance. And frankly, Uh, these types of attacks, 187 and others, really woke up the community and and emboldened them to be bold and to continue the the fight, if you will. Uh, I dare say from uh, from 2020 to today, the community is well aware of, uh, of what can happen, did happen, but I think we come out stronger. I think we learn from it. I think we continue to fight and go forward. Uh, when you look at today's administration, the Biden administration, you have people like Becerra and Mayorkas, Alex Padilla and the U.S. Senate. I think it's a recognition that we are there and that we have very capable people that can serve and can make a difference. I mean, the head of immigration uh, you know, is, is uh, Mr. Mallorca, uh, someone who's been active and militant his entire career. He knows what the issues are and what needs to happen. I think it is an expression of power shift that takes place. Are we done? No, we're not done. Are we going to be attacked again? Of course. But I think we've advanced significantly from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and, and today. I mean, I was shocked by the words and the vitriol that that Trump launched. But uh, I think we just 
come out stronger as a result of it. And we do have people in place that can launch the resistance to it. And we did. And I think we were successful at it. So for those reading uh, the book and, 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 and really one of the, the things that I appreciate, and, and I am a political scientist as well, of the book is that it's describing for generations, for the next generation or the current generation, what occurred in order for this generation to build upon it and not believe that they have to begin the wheel or, you know, rediscover the wheel. For those reading again the book and figuring out the future of, 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 of Brown America, of Latinos, Mexican Americans, Central Americans, South Americans, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, you know, the, the group that makes up, uh, you know, a Brown America. What's your specific vision for these communities in order for them to assure that they receive equal opportunities. And this is what I mean. Um, In California, Latinos are 40% of the state, yet only make up 7% of of the attorneys. There was a study that came out out of UCLA that it's going to take 500 years for Latinos to hit parity in the medical field. Only 3% of, 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 um, of producers and actors are are Mexican American, Central American. So while we had this power shift, you just don't have a small little equity gap. The equity gap is absolutely massive. And 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 you know, and let me just be very clear. I'm not saying, you know, Mr. Plow, this was, you know, your generation's fault, you know. No, let me just be very clear. Without what your generation did early on, I absolutely agree with what you said that with with Mr. Dr. Ayon that you know in previous generations they would have deported millions of us that's what would have happened in previous generations or there would have been you know police riots in in the streets we didn't have that because of what you did what should this generation do to make sure that those equity gaps in terms of opportunities um get solved and not just one or two you know we have shakira at the at the you know at the at the um at at the and on on football games at the super bowl not just not just these very um you know small gains but what is the political move to need to occur for the power political power shift to actually move into community power shift well i uh, first of all i'm an eternal optimist And secondly, I admire very much what the Jewish community has done. They have vowed and have a saying, never again. And they have launched an enormous educational program for their young people that has been generational. They all know, obviously, about the Holocaust and they're reminded of it all of the time. And they're drilled to get educated, know their history, and move the community forward. I admire that very much. I don't think that we're any different. You referenced Leon Panetta, who wrote the foreword. He said, this is an American dream. This is an American story. Not unlike the Jewish community, the Italian community, Irish community, and others, African-American community. And so to your question, the book really is intended to educate our young people. I want the book to be in the uh, K through 12 community colleges, the uh, state system, the UC system, so that people, A, would know their history and learn from it. I think that's first and, and a fundamental step that needs to take place, one. And then secondly, we are working on PowerShift 2 that addresses the issues of today. And it's not just elected office. It is people the role that educators have played, which has been tremendous. And I'm excited for everyone to read about the fact that we have the uh, recently the chairman of the board of the UC system, the president, the chancellor of the the state system, the chancellor of the community college system, all uh, educators that are leading our educational institutions that have an impact on curriculum and policy to our young students. PowerShift, the book, represents only but one step in making sure that our young people learn and know our history and and have lessons learned from it and can carry that 
forward. It's a long-term play, I admit, but something that we have to know. I, I'm just amazed when you talk, talk to young people today that they don't know who Cesar Chavez is. They don't know what he did. And uh, I, I'm amazed by that. And they can learn a lot from what he did and how he went about it. For God's sake, this is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I mean, we don't, there aren't that many, or maybe he's the only one in, ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize in the world. But Mr. Plot, I'm going to push back a, 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 bit, a bit at you at you here, and and um, I, jokingly early on, I, I, I said because I'm an attorney, I'm going to say prepare for your dep- community deposition, right? Jokingly, right? Okay. Um, let's get into some of the reforms, right? Because I've you know a new report came out by the Alliance for a Better Community. Um, that 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 really goes over and I and I commend them and we're going to be doing an interview, but that a lot of the community indicators haven't moved again, like like I mentioned. Right. A, the, the one number of uh, the one number that is in, increased is the number of politicians that we have that are brown, Latino, you know, that are Mexican-American, et cetera. Right. That's increased. Community outcomes have not Now, as I'm critical I'm also saying, hey, here in L.A., without our elected officials, all the new schools wouldn't have been built. Right. A lot of a lot of infrastructure. So as I'm being critical, there's I also understand the reforms that have been made just to, you know, uh, because when when viewers or when folks are watching this, it's just because we're critical doesn't mean that we don't understand what folks have done that has been correct. Okay, so you can have that balance as you're doing this. So what what were the reforms or changes that this generation that you that, that you interviewed and Dr. Ayon, what what are the what are the changes that they wanted or the reforms that they wanted during that time period? I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of change. I mean, the, starting with education, the the inequity in funding to uh, school districts changed. The uh, Senator Scutia authored the bill signed that mandated that uh, advanced, uh, what do you call it, advanced, the advanced uh, programs, I'm forgetting the term, Gabriel, that advanced placement uh, was not, was only in the wealthy school districts, not in every district. AP classes is what I was trying to say. Uh, Senator Scutia changed that. That was significant to Latino students to raise their GPAs and get into better, better colleges. The funding inequities that took place uh, on health care and health policy, that changed as well. The redistricting, uh, I mean, you know that Latino districts were cut up in different pieces so that representation, uh, you know, wouldn't be what it sh- could be today. Uh, uh, Councilman Alatorre authored the bill in the 80s that changed how you redistricted California and computerized it, which had never been done before. That created districts where people could be elected and why there's 26, 28 Latino members in the state legislature, including in Congress as well. Those are fundamental changes that these Los Diez were uh, were responsible for. But I but I hear you. We still have a long way to go. I just want us young and young people to know the history, learn from it, and carry the movement forward. So. You know, you go back, we go back to the Mendes case. Without the Mendes case, none of us would be here. And, 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 and let me just say, even Brown v. Board of Education could not have occurred or may have occurred later without. So without Mexican-American political activism, the current civil rights movement you know, would have occurred, but it, it helped mo- propel it. Without the, the, the Chicano movement, the same thing. Without this generation, to be clear, one thing that really grabbed me is that this generation had a spine of steel and they were successful. They redistricted maps. They, they, they had political workshops on how to get people elected. 
What I'm not seeing from this generation, please help me, help, help guide me, is for this generation to understand that level of commitment that this generation had in the political realm to making those changes and using their political equity to make things happen for actual community members besides just some a few of us simply getting in. So what are those behavior traits? What is that? What are the demands? And you said that we, my generation lacks that activism to get stuff done, right? So you, you tell me what my generation and our behavior should be doing in order to get stuff done. Uh, you know, I've gotten to know Mr. Alatore. And if I call Mr. Alatore within two seconds, he'll be, he'll, he'll tell me, what are you doing with this? What are you doing with that? Why aren't you producing this? You know, and, and, I, and I almost feel like apologizing within five seconds for not doing enough. And that's fine. But what, what, what should we learn today about them in order to get stuff today? Well, again, the purpose of PowerShip is, to, is for young leaders today to have their lessons learned reading about these leaders and how they went about doing things and how they affected change. But you know, I'm as critical as you are. Uh, if you have a uh, Latino leadership in Sacramento of 26, 28 members, if they had discipline, if they had a vision, which I don't think they do, and I've expressed that publicly, they could affect uh, any policy that they see Fit in Sacramento. The governor uh, would pay attention to a block of votes that could block or advance legislation in, in the legislature. Same thing with Congress. And I am critical because I say they don't know why they're there. They like the little lapel. They like the uh, attention they get from the lobbyists. And they forget why they're there. They forget what it is they're, they're supposed to be doing. So I'm as critical as you are, and I want them to learn from what happened, uh, what the Los Diaz did and, and others, and uh, have a vision, have a plan, have some intestinal fortitude to advance the agenda forward. Uh, I'm as critical as you are about that, Gabriel. So it, 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 um, thank you. And, and the purpose of bringing this up is, you know, in the 1960s, you know, it used to be said, we don't have enough Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, you know, who have PhDs. We don't have enough attorneys. And now we do, you know, and uh, let me give you an example. As Pierce College, we just have one Chicano Studies professor and 50 percent of the campus is, is brown. And. You know, and if these if 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 my generation is to advance quickly and, and you said that these things take time and, and, and this is where I would say to you and you tell me, Mr. Plot, if I'm incorrect and if I'm incorrect, I'm incorrect. If we really wanted to make a difference in, in, in medical technology, in, in well paid in a lot of these well paid jobs, um, we could do it in five to ten years. Could we not? No question about it. And again, it's a, a lack of vision and a lack of leadership to advance these, these programs. There, we, we have enough people in the institutions, all the institutions that you mentioned, including labor, education, uh, political offices to affect this change. And I'm not seeing the vision and the leadership to make that. And I agree with you, but we can and we should. Absolutely, Mr. Plow. We, we, we have, the, I mean, we could as a community, and this is what this book did. This book gave the, the roadmap of how the, a group of individuals got power. What, what was interesting is that they were connected to community and they got outcomes, but the community believed that if we simply got elected officials, that that was enough. And I think what we've learned, you know, now, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later is having elected officials is not only is simply or better yet is simply the beginning that if 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 community doesn't demand from elected officials, 
or or help nar- help that narrative, it won't happen. It, it, it won't happen. Am I correct? You're absolutely correct. And uh, Power Shift 2 talks about that, which will be out next year. Uh, but let's let's stop for a moment and talk about the advancement and the the art of the possibility. So we talked about Los Diaz, we talked about East LA, we talked about community. Generationally, what actually happened? Uh, and the second book will talk about this. Generationally, leaders went to even better schools. We had geographical diversity. We have leaders now coming from San Diego, Central Valley, Northern California. A lot of people think Javier Becerra is from East LA. He's from Sacramento. Senator Dean Flores, former majority leader from Bakersfield. Lorena Gonzalez from San Diego. Ben Wesso from San Diego. So we have the geographical diversity. We have individuals that went to outstanding schools. I mean, it was a big deal for me, and I'm proud of it, to go to East LA College, Cal State LA, eventually USC. But now we have people that are going to Harvard and Stanford and MIT and other places. What's my point? My point is that we have geographical diversity of wider reach, number one, and more expertise. I mean, I remember joking that that people didn't understand what the word policy meant. We have individuals now like Alex Padilla, Javier Becerra, who understand policy, understand politics, and can affect change in a very, very macro way. And um, But again, to your point, youngsters need to know their history. They need to have lessons learned, and they need to advance the agenda forward. This is not a thing of the... 60s and 70s. This, this is an issue of, 20, of 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 coming up. We have a, a presidential race coming up that's going to be very important nationally. And I think there'll be enormous opportunities for us. But one more thing uh, that, if I may, it's not just elected. Uh, second book is going to talk about the role of educators and the advancements that they have made, the role of entertainment the role of nonprofits, uh, the role of the media that can advance this forward. Now, are we there yet? No. The numbers you cited are, are, are dismal. But the recognition that we have that problem is a good start, and then we'll go from there. Mr. Plum, um, thank you very much. Let, let, let's talk about the the book and 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 how we can and how we can get it uh, used more by by K through twelfth twelfth um, in higher education. If you're an instructor in K through twelfth or in higher education, um, how is this book helpful um, and this interview helpful to them in that process of learning? Well, I I would submit to you that a lot of the material. Uh, and I, I think, let's reverse the deposition here. I think a lot of the material that exists, much, much of it, in my opinion, is not very good. Uh, we need better uh, writers. We need more books. We need more curriculum from which uh, instructors, professors can teach from. So fundamentally, in the, in the discussion today about ethnic studies, and uh, professors, teachers teaching from it, K through 12 and beyond. We need better material. Uh, We have launched a major effort, what we're calling book adoption, to get PowerShift into the schools uh, and the colleges. Not to sell books, I'm not interested in that, is to get the books in the hands of professors uh, from where they can teach the, the students. And uh, again, I think the material uh, is not very good out there, and we have to do better. Everyone has to pitch in on that. Are you and, and Dr. Ayon willing to 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 um, to meet with um, and be on Zoom um, um, meetings with students and interact with students to to talk about that narrative about again how what you outline and Dr. Ayon outline in the book 
can be used by instructors in K-12 and, and higher education? Are you willing to, um, to do uh, classroom presentations and things like that? Because I think it's very important. So I wanted to give you that opportunity. We've been doing that for more than a year. Uh, I like to say if there are three people together, I will be there. That will be with students, professors, uh, and uh, all of the above. We've been doing it and we're going to continue to do it. We will show up wherever we're invited. Uh, that's, that's just part of a process that has to take place. I enjoy doing it, especially meeting with the students. Um, and so we are available and we do, we have a quite an aggressive agenda approaching school districts and colleges. And by the way, the book is being taught already at several institutions. So, um, Mr. Plum, you have the, 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 the final word. Well, I appreciate the opportunity that uh, your audience can uh, listen to our discussion. Uh, it's very provocative, as it should be. I think it's healthy that we challenge one another. Uh, I would say to you that we off, we're off to a good start. Are we there yet? No. But if we can get uh, this material in the hands of students, if they can learn their history, they can learn uh, lessons learned from it and uh, uh, take that to professors and to elected officials, know what their history is, know how it was done, and realize that we're not there yet, and we have to advance the agenda, and it, it's never over. We have to continue on with this movement. Mr. Pla, I want to thank you. And to viewers, I want to make sure that, that, that you understand that you have someone who's been involved in helping communities for decades. And the fact that Mr. Plow, along with Dr. Ayon, put this in the book Power Shift, um, it's commendable. And I highly recommend that you buy the book. Um, like Mr. Plow said, it's not for the money, it's not for the royalties. It's about the narratives and the discussion that occurs with the discussion around power shift and how if, if brown communities, whether you're Mexican-American, Central American, South American, Puerto Rican, indigenous, or, or, or whichever term you use, this book will be able to outline. My generation has a lot to thank George Pla and the generation that came before for making a lot of those materials present. While we have critiques, and we do and we will continue to have critiques, it's also important to understand what the previous generation did well, what could be improved on, and also to document what we're doing for the next generation. So, as the anchor of Buena News, Gabriel Buena, everyone, thank you very much.